Okay, so here's our simple problem that we have. We have a, a simply, some, well, fairly simply supported beam. It has a pin joint here on my left and a roller joint here on the right. Now, the roller joint means that the forces can only act on the beam at right angles to the motion of the roller. So they can only act vertically upwards. Now, that's very helpful to us, um, especially seeing as we know, and this is not quite correct over here, we know that the reaction is going to be at right angles up here. So we'll call that R1. Well, yeah. Now, R1 and R2. So we have a reaction at right angles here. This joint, on the other hand, is a pin joint, which means that it's fixed in one plane. And forces can act at any direction, which is at right angles to the axis of that pin that goes through here. So we've indicated this force, it's unknown, by the squiggly line, we called it R2. So given all that, we've also labelled the spaces in between so we can use Bose notation. And that will give names to each of these vectors that are being loaded here. We've also given angles, which I haven't indicated. So that angle is 45 degrees, this angle is 60 degrees. Now I've scaled this so that my scale is 5 millimetres equals 1 kilonewton. And I've also said, in terms of distances, that um, 0.5 of a metre, or half a metre, is going to equal to 10 millimetres on my scale system. So that means that this distance over here, which I've just stepped off, I'll step these distances off for you, fairly simple, and very similar to a previous problem that we sorted, 0.5 metres, 1.5 metres, 1.5 metres, and 0.5 here. I hope all that makes sense. So there's the distances between the forces which we need to know. And with that information we've been asked to determine the reactions at R2 and R1. All right, so the first thing to do, we've labelled everything, we've organised our scale system, we've stated that, is to draw our force polygon. The force polygon will be able to be started. If we start it systematically, we'll go from left to right, and we'll begin with force AB here. So that's vector AB, this one vector BC, this one vector CD, this R reaction will be DE, and the last reaction over here, EA, should we need to use it and define. So let's start using our set square down here. We'll transfer this down a little bit so we can... And I know it's got to be a distance of 5 kilonewtons, which translates down to 25 millimetres. It's just about spot on. There it is. Got a vertical force coming down here at 7 kilonewtons. And the set square to transfer that across. And we can do this because of the principle of transmissibility of forces. That has to be 35 millimetres. Exactly. There it is. So that's my 7 kilonewton force. And lastly, I've got the active forces, which are the forces that are actually working on the beam rather than the reactions. The last active force is this distance, 4 kilonewtons, translates down to 20 millimetres, 10, 20, to there. There's the 5 kilonewton force, to here. Now, we know that there's going to be a reaction, which is vector DE, here, going vertically upwards. So, let's get our vertical line here from the vector at the top, and then move it across and indicate with a dotted line somehow this reaction R1, called it R1. There's going to be a second reaction at R2 which will have to have the effect of closing the vector polygon so that the system will be in equilibrium. So these will in fact be equilibrants, equilibrants, the reactions at R1 and R2, rather than a resultant, which would be the sum of the forces, active forces, which is not balanced at this point if we just look at a resultant by itself. Equilibrant means that that resultant is matched by an equal and opposite force 
causing the whole system to hang together in equilibrium. Right, now we need to know roughly, let's transfer these forces here that we have onto our space diagram and we'll use those forces to be able to determine uh, what will be the, uh, the R1 and R2. And we're doing this graphically, of course, as you can see. So let's first create a polar diagram here, which means we're going to pick a, a point, an external datum point, outside of the force system, and then use rays. So I'll use a red pen. These rays that we generate over here are actually resolving these vectors, these active force vectors, into components that we can apply quite easily onto our force, um, our free body diagram. There they are. Now if we label them, and this is point A, that's point B, point C, point D, based along this section here, this will be OA, and why are we doing this? OB, OC, that's a good question so that we can match up each of these rays with its correct vector representation around on the space diagram. That's the reason why we're labelling them, and you'll see why in a minute. So let's move these across. One of the features of this little setup is that we know that OA, which is this vector over here that I'm lining up at the moment, has to go through the pin joint reaction down here. It has to, because the force is transmitted by that pin joint. So we can draw OA rather than randomly as we did before, we can draw it going through the pin joint. It has to go through there. The next one, OB. Line it up carefully, get the angles as right correctly as possible. And if I'm a bit too far away, what I can do is move the, uh, the set square across a little bit. There we go, that gives me what I want. And very carefully draw that line across. So this OB line OB, or ray OB, travels in between vectors AB and BC. And there's AB, and there's BC, and there it is traveling in between. So we've got to preserve that geometry as we, we travel around here. Now I know what's going to happen here. As I do this, I'm going to end up finding myself a little bit of difficulty because we'll do it this way because I've got a light holding up right in the way of my vector movement. Now, let's get lined up properly to get OC across. It's worth taking your time with this because a small amount of movement can create a millimetre of difference in intersection points and a millimetre of difference when you look at our scale a millimetre means quite a lot when 10 mil or 5 millimetres is 1 kilonewton. So we can make a substantial difference to our answer. So it's best to try and get as accurately as you possibly can. Okay, and lastly, we've got OD coming around here. Now OD is going to travel off at an angle like this. And we also know that R1, we can complete this, has to go vertically up and it has to has to, has to, go through the reaction point, or the support point. So let's do this little line up there. That'll be DE. So that point over there, the reaction, the point where the line of action of the reaction force meets the last of these rays, which is the end of, or the last representing um, resolving vector for CD, that intersection point over there is going to need to be able to travel across all the way to the reaction point here at point at R2. And I'll show you why. So this line over here is called a closing line and we're going to pretend that the last vector which we don't know, this one over here, doesn't exist at the moment and we're going to use, try and locate this point here, with the point between O and R1, that last ray that would indicate the end of the vector at R1. And it really must go through this point here. And that's called a closing line. So I'll write that down for you. Closing line. Now that 
angle of that closing line, instead of taking from the polar diamond polar diagram and putting into your free body diagram, we're going to take from the free body diagram and then put it back into the polar diagram. What's the sense in doing that, you ask? Well, I think you'll see in a minute it's going to be very helpful for us. Move that down just a touch. Because <coughs> if we can substitute this line onto our polar diagram, which has our funicular polygon sitting on it, it'll tell us exactly where R1 finishes and where it joins onto the final force vector to go to R2 and it's just there. So I've transferred that line across, the closing line angle maybe a little bit off, probably to there, yeah, to there. So there's the closing line. Now that closing line gives me the ability now to draw the final vector, which is R2. There it is. So that's R2, which closes the polygon, R1 and R2. Now with R2 and R1 here on our polygon, we can measure off, just like we normally would, the distances and the, um, the lengths and the angles. So, so for R1, down the bottom over here, the reaction at point 0.1, it's going to be vertical. We've got a measurement of 35 millimetres, so it produces 35 millimetres. Now if we want to know what exactly that means, we've got to use our scale over here. So let's say our desired um, magnitude is R1 divided by 35 millimetres, just using a simple ratio. It's going to be the same as 1 kilonewton divided by 5 millimetres and that will give us the magnitude of R1. I can dig up a calculator as 35 divided by 5, 7. I should better work that out, should I? So that gives us 7 kilonewtons at the reaction vertically upwards at R1. And for R2, we need to measure some angles. And just for magnitude, though, we can say that R2 over, and let's measure it here now, it's a little bit less, so no, it's a bit more, actually, it's 37. 37, R2 over 37 millimetres, it's going to equal to 1 kilonewton over 5 millimetres, giving the reaction at R2. to be equal to 37 divided by 5, 7.4 kilonewtons, so slightly larger, 7.4 kilonewtons. Now this one here is going to have an angle, so let's work this angle out. We need to get a, a horizontal line here, there's the horizontal line taken from the free body diagram, using a protractor. I have over here, get this onto the zero, so I line up the crosshairs and R2 is going to go through there, so it's about 78 degrees, so it's going to be 78 degrees, it's acting up that way, that's 78 degrees. And there we have the reactions at R1 and R2 solved graphically. And, you know, hopefully you'll find that fairly efficient. Thank you.